few minutes, inshallah, please turn the cell phone pages off. نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه. إن شاء الله تعالى we would like to welcome everyone to Masjid al our first uh, spring annual spring conference. الحمد لله تعالى Brother Mustafa Zawaj from Masjid Muslimin has allowed us to benefit from him. الحمد لله just a few brief things before we start, not to belabor the issue. But our brother Mustafa George, who is the Imam of National Muslimin in Brooklyn, New York, is also a graduate from Medina University in the School of Dawa. He's also studied under Sheikh, I'm sorry, under the School of Hadith. He also studied under Sheikh Abdul Muslim Al Abad for seven years, and also Sheikh Udayr al-Jabri for five years, and also Sheikh Rabi' for a year and a half. He spent a total of seven years at the school of Medina University. So without further, we would like to allow the brother to bless us today with a lecture dealing with the importance of the connection or the importance of being connected or staying connected with the people of knowledge. In Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadahu wa Nasainahu wa Nasafiru, when I would be the Lahi in Shururi and Fushina, when in Sayyia Fi Amalina, when Yahdi Hilahu Fala Mudalla, when in Yudilil Fala Hadiella. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسول يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رصيدا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا شديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد إن أصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور مفتتاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Before beginning uh, with today's lecture I would like to thank uh, the Ikhwa that have invited me to, uh, to m- I myself benefit uh, in reward in giving a speech giving a kalima to the brothers so I would like to thank the brothers at uh, Masjid al Ghurba for inviting me and giving me the chance to earn this reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, top, the topic, as it was mentioned by the brother, the topic that we will be speaking about today is the importance of uh, being connected to the scholars. And there's no doubt that this is a very important subject to the Muslim, in the life of the Muslim, every Muslim. And the way that I'm going to bring across uh, and deliver this particular subject is by explaining to the people the importance or explaining to the people the merits of the ulama. Explaining to the people the merits of the ulama, the merits of the scholars in Islam. Because if an individual understands the merits and the position of the scholars in Islam, 
By that, he will understand the importance of being connected to those individuals. If he understands the position and the greatness of the scholars and the nobility of the scholars in Islam, then if he understands that, he would see the importance of being connected to those individuals. If we were to look into the book of Allah, if we were to look into the book of Allah, the Quran, we would find many nusus, we would find many ayat, many verses in the book of Allah that talk about the importance or give a proof and uh, illustrate the importance of the Salah. And from amongst those nusus, from amongst those texts and those ayat in the book of Allah, is the statement of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, Shahid Allah annahu la ilaha illahu. والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط. الله سبحانه وتعالى says شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو. that Allah bears witness that there is no deity worship worship except Him. Allah bears witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Him. والملائكة and the angels وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط and the people of knowledge and the people of knowledge. this is one of the verses. That the scholars of the past and the scholars of the present use to show the merits of the scholars in Islam. And that is shown in this ayat in several ways, more than one. For one, and we'll begin the ayat again, Allah bears witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except Himself. Allah bears witness that there's no deity worthy of worship except Himself. And the angels, and the people of knowledge, and the people of knowledge. So, one way that this ayat, that this ayat shows the greatness and the merits of the people of knowledge is that Allah did not mention all of mankind to bear witness that Allah is one. Allah did not mention all of mankind to bear witness that Allah is one. But Allah mentioned Himself, He mentioned the angels, and He mentioned the scholars. So this ayat is a clear proof from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show the merits of the scholars in Islam. That Allah did not mention everybody. Allah did not say, Allah bear wit- bears witness that He is the only one worthy of worship, and the angels, and the jinn, and the believers, and the kufr. Allah didn't say that. Allah said Himself, and the angels, and the scholars. So this shows the greatness of the scholars. Well, this is one of the ways uh, proven from the ayat of the greatness of the scholars, is that Allah used them to bear witness that Allah is one. Another thing taken from the same ayat, that shows the greatness and the importance of the scholars in Islam is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joins the bearing the witness of the scholars with the bearing witness of himself and the angels with the bearing witness of himself and the angels and there's no doubt when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the book and when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sunnah put something right beside Allah azza wa jal then that shows the great importance of it and that shows the great importance of it and an example of that just to make it more clear an example of that is when the Prophet ﷺ was asked by the Sahaba, what is the greatest thing? What is the greatest thing or one of the, what is the best action that can enter me into Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, worship Allah wa la tushriku bihi shay'a. The Prophet ﷺ said, worship Allah and don't commit any partners with Him. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and righteousness or piety or kindness towards your parents. And kindness towards your parents. So the fact that the fact that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned kindness towards your parents after the worship of Allah shows that this is a great uh, subject, shows that this is something very important. Because it's connected with the mentioning of Allah So in this ayat, so in this ayat we find that Allah is mentioning Himself, that Allah is mentioning the angels, and that Allah is mentioning the scholars. So the fact that Allah is putting the scholars with Himself and the angels in the ayat shows the importance of the scholars. Another thing from the ayat, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the scholars, the mentioning of the scholars right beside the mentioning of the angels. And we know the greatness of the angels in terms of the angels Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is a creation this is a creation that they do not disobey Allah and they do whatever they are told. This is a creation that they do not disobey Allah and they do whatever they are told. And we know these are the, this is the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used uh, to send down his revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that malaika and from amongst them Jibreel alayhi salatu salam to send down his re- revelation. So this is from the greatest of creations, the malaika. 
the angels. And we find Allah Azzawajal in this ayat mentioning the angels, or mentioning the scholars right alongside the angels. Mentioning the scholars right alongside the angels. That shows the importance and the greatness of the scholars. Questions are at the end of the time. You find it uh, in Surah Ali Imran, the 18th ayat. Surah Ali Imran, the 18th ayat. So that's, uh, and another thing that shows the importance of the scholars from the same, from the same ayat is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, does not use the bearing of witness from anyone from amongst his creation except those who are praiseworthy. Except those who are praiseworthy. مثلاً, and this is ma'kul jiddan, this is understood. If you want, for example, to prove something, you won't take any individual from the street that you don't know, any individual that's involved in sin and transgression and evil and disobedience. If you want him to mess and witness your marriage, you know, because from the conditions of marriages that you have two witnesses, you won't take anybody from the street and say, come, come, I just want you to witness my marriage. But you would take, take an individual that you trust. You would take an individual that's trustworthy. Right? So in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses individuals that are trustworthy. Uses individuals that are praiseworthy. And those are the scholars. Because Allah said, Allah bears witness that He's the only one to be worshipped. And the angels and the scholars. And just as we in our lives would not use anyone, would not use anyone to witness our affairs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just use anyone to witness this affair. But Allah used the angels and the scholars, which informs of the importance of the scholars. Also, from the ayat, which are several, which are several, which should be understood before continuing, is that uh, this talk on the, the merits of the scholars and the importance of having a relationship and a connection to the scholars, it's something that if we were to try to sit down in one hour, we could not do. Because the ayat from the Book of Allah are very great in this regard. And they are very uh, plentiful and replete in this regard. As well as in the Sunnah of the Messenger So we're just trying to shed some light. We shed some light on the particular subject. And we said, it shouldn't be understood that these are all the things from the Book of Allah and all of the hadith, or the prophetic traditions from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam use them to prove this subject. Yeah, but these are only some. From the Book of Allah Ta'ala, you also have the statement of Allah Azzawajal in Surah Zumar. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ The Surah Al-Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do those who know, are they like those who do not know? Are those who know, are they like and are they similar to those who do not know? In this ayat, the ulama use it as a proof. They use it as a proof to show the merits and the fadila of the scholars. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in this ayat, uh, he's asking a question. But we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in no need of asking a question. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a question so that we can reflect over it. So that we can contemplate over that which is being mentioned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are those who know like on the same level as those who do not know? And verily the answer is no. Verily the answer is is no. But from that we take that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing the cross to the individual as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ Verily those who understand this are the people that have understanding. Verily those who comprehend this are the people that have individuals that have understanding. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking us a question because He as a does not know. Because we know, we know from the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is He is Al-Aleem. Is that He is the all-knowing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking asking a question in order for you to inform him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a question in order for you to reflect. In order for you, every individual, to reflect over it. And the answer to the question is that. An individual that knows Allah, that knows the, the, the names of Allah, that knows the characteristics of Allah, the worship of Allah, the book of Allah, the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's not like an, in, uh, any other individual. He's not like any other individual. But in fact, the scholars... And there's no doubt, from that we take the merits of the scholars, because verily they know Allah more than anyone. They know Allah more than anyone. They know the Book of Allah more than anyone. They know the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than anyone, the scholars. Right? So their degree and their merits 
is above the no- normal layman. It's above the normal layman. Fine, you might have an individual that says, but Allah didn't say, and I don't think anyone uh, from amongst us would understand this, but you might have some that would say, but Allah didn't say that they are higher. Allah, in this ayat, in Surah Zumar, Allah did not say that they are higher. Allah did say, but are they the same? Well, Allah did not say that they are higher. So in this, an individual might say, in this you don't have a clear proof. But the reality of it is that you do. Because in another ayat, in another ayat of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا لِعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in another ayat of the Qur'an, which is in Surah Al-Mujadala, He said, Allah raises those who believe from amongst you, Allah raises those who believe from amongst you, and those who have knowledge, Allah raises them in levels. Allah raises them in levels. So it's from that first ayat or that second ayat that we mentioned, we understand that the scholar is not like the, 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 the layman. We understand that the scholar is not like the layman. But if an individual was to say, but that doesn't prove that the scholars are above, or that doesn't prove the scholars are greater than the likes of that, but in another ayat of the Book of Allah, the Surah Al-Mujadala, in another ayat you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He raises those who believe, and the scholars, Allah raises them in levels. Allah raises them in levels. At this point, you might have another shubha. You might have another doubt. And that is the statement of an individual who says, I believe. I'm a Muslim. I believe. I pray. So, I still don't see the difference between me and them. I still don't see the, the, that there's a difference, Yanni. I still don't see that they're higher. Because Allah says He raises those who believe and those who have knowledge. So, Allah raises these people and Allah raises these people. So still, there's still no difference in level. We should understand that. The ulama mentioned this is dhikrul khasi ba'd al This is Allah mentioning specific after mentioning general. Allah mentioned specific after mentioning general. Because when Allah said, Allah raises those, who, those amongst you who believe. Allah raises those amongst you who believe. There's no doubt the scholars are from amongst those believers. The scholars are from amongst the individuals that believe. But when Allah mentions something specific, Afan, when Allah mentions something general, and then immediately after He mentions something specific, which is in fact from that general, from that general statement that He mentioned, is to show that this one is greater than that one. Is to show that this one is greater than that one. So, as the ulama of Tafsir mentioned, so when Allah said, Allah raises those who believe from amongst you, they're raised, without a doubt, they're raised, believers, they're raised. And those who have been given knowledge, yani, and those who have been given knowledge is raised even higher. And those who have been given knowledge is raised even higher than those who believe. So this is, uh, these are the statements of the ulama, of the ulama of tafsir with regards to, uh, those particular, those particular, uh, ayat. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact raises those who believe, and he raises the scholars above and over those who believe. And there's no doubt that this particular thing, or that which we have mentioned, shows the merits of the scholars. It shows the merits of the scholars. And in, those, in that which we mentioned, we can understand that uh, the statement of Allah Taala, ما فرّتنا في الكتاب من ما فرّتنا في في الكتاب من شيء. Allah said, we have not left anything out in our book. We have not left anything out in our book. And Allah Taala says, اليوم أكمل لكم دينكم. And today we have completed your favor, or we have completed your religion for you. So, with us mentioning those doubts every once in a while, because it's possible that an individual hears something and then he might have a doubt. It's possible an individual hears something and he might have a doubt. So every once in a while, when I mention something, I might mention, and from this a person might have a doubt. And the answer to that, to that doubt is such and such. Because nothing is left out of the Book of Allah. Nothing is left out of the Book, nor from the Son of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So every once in a while, if we feel that an individual might have a doubt, to show that an individual might have a doubt with something that he's mentioned, we can mention uh, a response to that. We can mention a response to that. Another thing that shows the merits and the greatness uh, of the scholars is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءَ وَمَنْ يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, toward the end of the surah, Allah gives the hikmah 
to whomever he wills. Allah gives the hikmah to whomever he wills. So we know the ulama of tafsir, they describe al-hikmah to mean several things. From amongst those meanings is the sunnah. From amongst those meanings is wisdom. From amongst the meanings is righteous actions. So in this ayat, Allah says he gives the wisdom, he gives the sunnah, he gives the righteous actions to whomever he wills. To whomever he chooses and to whomever he wills. And then Allah says, وَمَن يُؤْتِي الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا وَمَن يُؤْتَى الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And whoever is given these things, then he has been given much good. Then he has been given much good. In this ayah, the ulama say, this shows, this is a clear proof that Allah wants good for the scholars. This is a clear proof that Allah wants good for the scholars. Because no one, no one has wisdom like the scholars do. And no one knows the sunnah, after, of course, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, no one knows the sunnah like the scholars. And no one knows the sunnah, or no one has uh, knowledge like the scholars. So in this ayat, this ayat, and istinbakum in al-ayat, or the deduction of that which is understood from the ayat, is that those that Allah Taala wants good for, He gives them hikmah. We're going to prove that also in the sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ later on. But those that Allah wants good for, He gives them understanding. He gives them understanding of the sunnah. He gives them knowledge. And no one has more of that wisdom, understanding, the sunnah and the likes of that than the scholars. So this means that Allah wants good for these individuals. So this means that Allah wants good for these individuals. So this is another thing which is used to show uh, the greatness of the scholars. Another thing from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that shows the greatness of the scholars is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَةِ Verily those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَةِ Those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. And Ibn Qayyim, although we're going to make another deduction from that, uh, or understanding from that ayat, but before we do that, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned in his Kitab al-Fawa'id, in a book called the Book of Fawa'id, the Book of Benefits, he mentioned why. Why those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. And he said the reason why, لِأَنَّهُ مَنْ كَانَ أَعْرَفْ بِهِ فَهُوَ أَخْشَ لَهُ He said the person that knows Allah the most, the person that knows Allah the most, this brings about fear of Allah. This brings about fear of Allah. And this is a great benefit for all of us. Because day in and day out, we find uh, the different struggles that we're having with obedience to Allah. The different struggles that we're having with obedience to Allah. As we At times we find ourselves having uh, strength in our Iman. At times we find ourselves having strength and stability in our Iman. And at times we find ourselves uh, swaying. We find ourselves submitting to our desires. Going against that which is pleasing to Allah. Right? The ulama mentioned, as it was mentioned by Ibn Qayyim in that same uh, book that we just mentioned, the book of Salah, the book of benefits. One of the ways an individual can strengthen his Iman, one of the ways an individual can strengthen his obedience to Allah is he learns more that he seeks to learn more. Because you can't fear someone you don't know. You can't fear something you don't know. So if a person, مثلاً, if a person is jahil, if a person is ignorant, he does not know, he's weak in knowledge, then this individual cannot bring about taqwa. This individual cannot bring, bring about khushu. Because he doesn't know what is it. Individual cannot fear Allah because he doesn't know the greatness of Allah. He cannot, rather than hide his sins from Allah, or I should say, abandon sinning, because he doesn't realize that Allah hears and Allah sees everything he does. So an individual, and it's the great benefit that we receive from the statement of Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, an individual, when he knows Allah, and he learns more about Allah, that knowledge brings about taqwa. That knowledge, when it's done with sincerity, it brings about fear of Allah. It brings about consciousness of Allah, as a of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Right? And uh, Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah Ta'ala also in another book that he has, in Nuniya, he mentioned the, the great evil, the great evil and uh, disease of ignorance and how ignorance can lead a person to his own destruction. 
And when he says, وَالْجَهْلُ دَاءٌ قَاتِلٌ وَشَفَاءُهُ أَمْرَانِ فِي التَّرْقِيبُ مُتَّفِقَانِ Actually, النُنِي صوتي So he says, وَالْجَهْلُ دَاءٌ قَاتِلٌ وَشَفَاءُهُ أَمْرَانِ فِي التَّرْقِيبُ مُتَّفِقَانِ نَفْسٌ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ وَمِنْ سُنَّةٍ وَطَبِيبٌ ذَاكِ الْعَالِمُ الرَّبَّانِ Ibn Qayyim رحمه الله تعالى He says, an ignorance is an ignorance is a detrimental disease. It is a disease that will lead to your death. Ignorance is a disease that will lead you to your death, to your destruction. And its cure is two affairs. And its cure is two affairs. An ayat from the Book of Allah or something from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An ayat from the Book of Allah or from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a doctor. And that is the scholar. Once again, ignorance is a detrimental and it is a disease that will lead to your death. Ignorance is a disease that will lead to your death. And its cure is two affairs. Something from the Book of Allah, an ayat from the Book of Allah, or something from the sin of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a doctor, who is the scholar. As a statement of Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah Ta'ala, in his book, which is poetry called al Numiya. Right. So we mentioned that the scholars are, that, that which shows uh, from the mouth of the scholars is a statement of Allah that the scholars fear Allah the most. In the mayaqsa Allah min ibadihi al-ulama. Those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. Taken from that ayat and added to another ayat, we have a statement that the scholars are the best of creation after the prophets. The scholars are the best of mankind after the prophets. Because we know the best of mankind is the prophets. And the best of amongst them is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But after the Anbiya wal Mursaleen, after the Prophets and the Messengers, the scholars are the best of creation. And the reason why we take that is because in that first ayat which we mentioned, those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. Those who fear Allah the most are the scholars. Right. In Surah Al-Bayyina, in Surah Al-Bayyina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Right, follow along with me. In Surah Al-Bayyina, toward the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily those who believe and do righteous actions, Verily those who believe and do righteous actions, they are the best of creation. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, جَزَاؤُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتُ عَدْنٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْحَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا عَبَدَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوعًا ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشِيَ رَبَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who believe and do righteous actions, they are the best of creation. Their reward is paradise. Underneath which rivers flow. Right? Their reward is paradise. Underneath which rivers flow. They will be in it forever. They are, Allah is pleased with them. They are pleased with Allah. This is for those who fear Allah. This is for those who fear Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you at the end of the ayat, or from the beginning, or from the middle of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you the best of people. Then He tells you the reward for the best of people. And then at the end He says, this is for those who fear Allah. Fine, now take it back to the first ayat. Those who fear Allah the most are who? The scholars. So we understand from that ayat, connecting this ayat to that ayat, that the best people are the scholars. Because they are the ones that fear Allah the most. And Allah said, this is the reward for those that fear Allah the most. Or this is the reward for those who fear Allah. And the ones that fear Allah the most are the scholars. The ones who fear Allah ta'ala the most are the scholars. So this is from, uh, from the book of Allah ta'ala, or from these nasuf, these different texts, these different ayat that we've mentioned from the book of Allah informs the Muslim of the greatness and the importance and the merits of the scholars. Of the scholars in Islam and the position and the statue of the scholars in Islam. Before continuing from mentioning from the, the different uh, to, to, uh, prophetic traditions from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would like to make a waqfa. We like to take a second. And that is, if you've known everything or if you've paid attention to everything that we've mentioned, it's been from the Book of Allah. It's been the different ayat, the different verses from the Book of Allah. And that informs you, an individual, an individual that takes time to read the Book of Allah, an individual that takes time to read the Book of Allah, and to study the Book of Allah, this affair is clear to him. This affair is clear to him. He would understand the importance of the scholars because he reads the Book of Allah. 
He reads the Book of Allah, and he reads it with contemplation, and he studies the Book of Allah, and the likes of that. But the musibah, the greatest of, of, of trials or hindrances in the life of many of the Muslims today is that many of the Muslims do not read the Book of Allah. And many of the Muslims do not read the Book of Allah. But in fact, they have made hajar. They have migrated from the Book of Allah. They have migrated from the Book of Allah. So when an individual, when an individual migrates from the Book of Allah, and in it you find guidance, and in it you find a cure, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Hudan lil muttaqin, in it you find guidance for those who, uh, who fear, and the likes of it, and the likes of it. So if an individual was in fact to read the Book of Allah, if he was in fact uh, to take time out of his life, out of his busy schedule to study the Book of Allah, then a lot of the affairs that are unclear will become clear to him. A lot of the affairs that are unclear will become clear to him. But that is when, that is when the individual takes out of his time uh, to study the Book of Allah, to learn the Book of Allah, and the likes of that. Another thing, if we were to continue, although, I, like I mentioned, everything was not mentioned. Everything, all of the ayat were not mentioned because they are, they are plentiful. There are many that are free in regard to uh, in regard to this particular subject of the marriage and the, the status of the scholars. But we just mentioned a few of them. But now we want to go to the sunnah. We would like to go to the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to look at this affair as well. And that is uh, from the many dif- different traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that inform of the, the position of the scholars in Islam is the hadith, or from amongst those traditions, is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of Muawiyah, the uh, Nabi Sufyan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, which is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُتَقْتِفُ فِي الدِّينِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever Allah wants good for, Whoever Allah wants good for, Allah gives him understanding of the religion. Whoever Allah wants good for, Allah gives him understanding of the religion. And this in fact informs us of something that we had mentioned in the previous ayat. Something that we had mentioned in the previous ayat. We mentioned uh, that Allah wants good for the scholars because he gives them understanding of the religion. This is also mentioned in this hadith. So whoever, as the scholars mentioned, whoever Allah wants good for, Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for in this life and in the hereafter, Allah gives that individual fiqh of this religion. Allah gives them understanding of this religion, which is a clear proof that informs of the merits of the scholars. Why? Because the people that know the religion the most, the people that know the religion the most after the death of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are the scholars, are the scholars. So because of that, we can understand the result of because of that, we understand and we take that this must mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for these individuals because Allah has given them the greatest understanding of the religion after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has given them the greatest understanding of the religion. And we know when we say the scholars, we're not skipping the Sahaba because you had scholars from amongst the Sahaba. So we're saying after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his messenger, his last messenger, Muhammad bin Abdullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people that had the greatest understanding were the scholars. The scholars from amongst the Sahaba, the scholars from amongst the Tabi'een and the Atba'i Tabi'een until today. So this is a sign, this is a direct proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for them. Because Allah gave them the most understanding of the religion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it. Man yudidi Allahu bihi khayran yifaqihu fi deen. Whoever Allah wants good for, Allah, Allah gives them understanding of the religion. Allah gives them understanding of the religion. And the scholars also use this as an encouragement. They also mention this particular hadith, the hadith of Muawiyah. The scholars also mention it as an encouragement for everyone to take some time out to learn the religion. For everyone to take some time out to learn the religion. Because when an individual takes some time out to learn the religion and he becomes more knowledgeable, then this is a sign. Then this is a sign that Allah wants good for that individual. So if you want to be from amongst, if you want to be from amongst the individuals that uh, is given a sign that Allah wants good for him in this life and the hereafter, then be from amongst those who study. Then be from amongst those who study Islam. Then be from amongst those who study Islam. Because when you do so, and you find yourself increasing, you find yourself increasing in uh, the recitation of the Qur'an, the memorization of the Qur'an, the memorization of the Hadith, 
the understanding, when you find yourself increasing, this is an apparent sign that Allah wants good for you. When you do it with sincerity. When you do it with sincerity. And the reason why we say when you do it with sincerity is because of the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned it's first three individuals that will be thrown into the hellfire on Yawm al Qiyamah. So Abu Huraira, with the Prophet, the hadith of Abu Huraira, where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the first three people that will be thrown into the hellfire on Yawm al Qiyamah. And from amongst those people is, from amongst those people was a person that learned the Quran. A person that learned the Quran and taught the Quran. He will be brought forth and it will be said to him or he will be reminded of the ni'mah of Allah. فَعَرَفَهَا And he recognized it. He admitted it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, what did you do with it? Allah azza wa jalla asked him, what did you do it? What did you do with it? And he said, I taught, I taught the Qur'an. I taught the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would say to him, you have lied. But verily, you learned the Qur'an. Verily, you learned the Qur'an and taught it so that the people can praise you. So that the people, so that the people can praise you. And this individual will be thrown or dragged on his face into the house. So that's very important that the individual does not just say, I want to become knowledgeable. I want to become knowledgeable and I want the people to praise me and the likes of that, but that the individual does it with sincerity. He does it sincerely seeking the face of Allah. Because it can be one of the means of destruction for him. If he does it with riya, if he does it with sum'ah, if he does it with pride, and if he does it so that the people can uh, praise him, and the people can glorify him, and the people can place him on a pedestal and the likes of that, if the individual seeks knowledge for that reason, then he should know that it will be a means for him, for him entering the hellfire. It will be a means for him entering the hellfire. Another hadith, the hadith of uh, Uthman bin Affan. Uthman bin Affan is Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best of you is the one that learns the Qur'an and teaches it. The best of you, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best of you is the one who learns the Qur'an and teaches it. This is another proof to show that, or to show the merits of the scholars. To show the merits of the scholars. Because the people that teach us the Qur'an, the people that explain to us the Qur'an are the scholars. The scholars of the past, from amongst the time of the Sahaba, to the time of the Tabi'een and the Atba' al-Tabi'een, and the four great Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, all the, way, all the way until today. So the scholars are the ones that teach the people the Qur'an. So in that hadith, we find a direct proof for the merits of the scholars. Because the Prophet said, the best of you, the best of you, are the ones that learn the Qur'an and teach it. And the ones that learn the Qur'an and teach it are the scholars. Are the scholars, the scholars in the religion. So this is another proof to show you the merits of the scholars. And in fact, that they are from the best of the creation. As we mentioned it in the ayat. As we mentioned it in the ayat uh, previously. Another thing that shows you the, the merits of the scholars, and it clarifies to the people the merits of the scholars, is a somewhat long hadith. And it's on the authority of Abi Darda, one of the famous companions, one of the ulama from amongst the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and this hadith, in fact, came in a story. And that was Abu Darda, Abu Darda, after the death of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and during the different uh, rulerships, Abu Darda migrated to Damascus. He migrated to an area north of al Medina, which at that time, is, even till today, was called Damascus, which is in the area of Syria. Which is in the area of Syria. Abu Darda was in this area. And an individual by the name of Qais ibn Abi Kathir, who was from amongst the Tabi'in, he heard a hadith. He heard a hadith in al Medina or in Mecca somewhere. And the narrator of the hadith was Abu Darda. It was Abu Darda. Abu Darda had said a hadith, had said a prophetic tradition on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Qais ibn Abi Kathir, he was from amongst those individuals that they would seek ulul uh, al-Isnaq. Ulul al Isnad yani, that, مثلاً, I heard it from this individual who told me so-and-so told him, who told him, so-and-so told him. But instead of me just, just uh, uh, you know, sufficing with the brother, I go to the person that he heard it from. I go to the person that he heard it from. So, this individual, Kaysman Abi Kathir, he heard it from somebody. That Abu Darda said such-and-such. Such, a prophetic tradition, a hadith. 
So he did not suffice with the person he heard it from. But he wanted to hear it from the mouth of the Sahabi. He wanted to hear it from the mouth of the Sahabi. And that Sahabi was Abu Darda. So he found out where Abu Darda was. And he took a trip to Syria. And we know those days, those days a trip from al Medina to Syria might take 10 days, might take 15 days, because they did not have planes and jets and cars and the likes of that during the time of the Tabi'in. So this individual case, Nabi Kathir, went to Damascus. He went to Syria to hear the hadith straight from Abu Darda's mouth. So when he arrived, Abu Darda questioned him, where did you come from? He said, I came from al Medina." Then he said, what brought you here? He said, a hadithun sami'atu anna kakultu. He said, a hadith that I heard that you said. So Abu Darda looked at him and he said, you didn't come, you didn't come for any business. He said, no. He said, you didn't come out of need. He said, no. He said, the only thing you came for was a hadith. He said, yes. A hadith that you heard that I said? He said, yes. He said, Abu Darda at that moment said, at that moment, said verily I heard the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man salafa tariqan yabtaghi bihi ilman sahal allahu bihi tariqan ila al-jinnah. The, Abu Darda said several sentences. We're going to translate one by one. Abu Darda said, if that's what you came for, then know that verily I heard the messenger say, anyone who treads a path, anyone who walks a path seeking knowledge, Allah makes his path easy for him to give him. Anyone who walks a path, treads a path, goes along a way seeking knowledge, Allah makes his path easy for him to give him. وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَدْعُوا أَجْمِحَتَهَا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ رِيدًا بِمَا يَسْنَحُ And verily the angels lower their wings. And verily the angels lower their wings for a student of knowledge out of pleasure for what he's doing. Out of pleasure for what he's doing. وَإِن وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمَ لَيَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ حَتَّى الْحَيْتَانُ فِي الْمَاءِ And verily, every, verily, everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholars. Even the fish in the sea. Even the fish in the sea. وَإِنَّ فَضُلَ الْعَالَمِ وَعَلَى الْعَابِدِ فَالْقَمَرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ And verily the merit and the statue of the scholar compared to the worshipper, the regular worshipper, is like the moon compared to the stars. Is like the moon compared to the stars. وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَرَثَةَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَإِنَّ الْأُلَمَاءِ وَرَثَةَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And verily the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ لَمْ يُوَرَّثُوا دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْحَمًا And verily, the Prophets did not leave back for inheritance wealth. وَإِنَّمَا وَرَّثُوا عِلْمًا فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِهِ فَقَدْ أَخَذَ بِحَذٍ وَافِرٍ And whoever takes, verily the, verily the Prophets did not leave back wealth. But that which they left back was knowledge. But that which they left back was knowledge. And whoever takes it then has taken, then verily he has taken a strong handhold. Then verily he has taken a strong handhold. Abu Darda, radiallahu ta'ala, when he heard that this man had come from such a far distance, that during that time it would take 10, 15 days to reach. And he said, you didn't come for, you didn't come for money, you didn't come for trade, you didn't come for anything, you didn't come for marriage, you didn't come for anything, you only came to hear a hadith. When Abu Darda, heard that this individual, Qais bin Abi Kathir, only came for this, then he told this individual this great hadith. He told this individual the great hadith. And we're going to take the hadith jumla ten jumla. We're going to take it sentence by sentence to show the merit of the scholar. For one, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever treads a path seeking knowledge, Allah will make his path easy for him to jinnah. Allah will make his path easy for him to jinnah. In this, you have an encouragement. You have an encouragement. For every Muslim, for every Muslim to take a portion of his life, to take a portion of his time, and to seek knowledge. Because all of us want, all of us want to know, and I would hope this is the case, because it was the case with the Sahab, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were the most eager to find out how to enter Jannah. Many times, you had the Sahaba coming up to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, Allimini, Allimini Shay'an, 
as yudkhilu nil jannah. Many times you have the sahaba coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and saying, Ya Rasulullah, teach me something that can enter me into jannah. They wanted to know how to enter into jannah. What's the easiest way to enter jannah? What's the best way to enter jannah? What's the quickest way to enter jannah? Sahaba always used to ask this type of question to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all of, we hope that this is the case for all of us, that we want to know the best way, the easiest way uh, of entering or in entering into Jannah. So, in this hadith, you have the Prophet sallallahu informing the Muslims how to do it. And one of the easiest ways to do it. One of the easiest ways to do it. And this is something that the Muslim must reflect over. Because the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he said, حُطْفَةِ الْجَنَّةِ بِالْمَقَارِيَةِ وَحُفَّةِ النَّارِ وَحُفَّةِ النَّارِ بِالشَّحَوَاتِ The Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Jannah has been surrounded with difficulty, trials. It has been surrounded with difficulty, hardships. And the hellfire has been surrounded with desires. The hellfire has been surrounded with desires. This is something we all understand. That entering into Jannah, the way to Jannah is difficult. Because Jannah is surrounded with difficulties. It's surrounded with difficulties. Right. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ informs you how do you get, one of the ways you get through those difficulties. One of the ways that you get through those difficulties. And that is by seeking knowledge. And that is by seeking knowledge. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever treads a path in seeking knowledge, Allah will make his path easy for him to jinnah. Easy for him to jinnah. And Allah ﷻ tells us, tells you in Surah Al-Rahman, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ is not the reward for doing good, except that Allah gives you good. It's not the reward for you doing good, except that Allah gives you good. So when an individual takes out of his time, when an individual takes out of his time, and he buys books, and he listens to tapes, and he travels to sit amongst the scholars, and the likes of this, because he took out of his time, and because he went through a form of struggle in this life, Allah makes his path easy for him to Jannah. Allah makes his path easy for him to Jannah. So this is an encouragement for the brothers and for the sisters, to seek knowledge. And by doing so, you would make your path easy for you to Jannah. You would make your path easy for you to Jannah. And then the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned the second thing. وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَدْعُوا أَجْنِحَتَهَا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ رِضًا بِمَا يَحْنَى And verily the angels lay down their wings. Verily the angels lower their wings to a student of knowledge being pleased with that which he did. Being pleased with that which he did. And this is a merit. This shows you the greatness of the scholars. Because there is no doubt that the scholars, they are the, at the top of the students of knowledge. They are at the top of the students of knowledge. This great creation, the Mala'ika, the great creation, the Mala'ika, meaning one of the greatest of creations, the size of the, of the Mala'ika. You know, if you were to read the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and realize the size of the Mala'ika, and what's the distance between their shoulders and their ears and the likes of that? You will read the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah from the greatest of the creation. From the greatest of the creation. That's with regards to their size. And then with regards to their ibadah. With regards to their worship. As Allah Ta'ala says, لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ They do not disobey Allah. They do not disobey Allah. And they do whatever they are told. So this is from the greatest of the creation. And the ulama of the past and the present, they disagree. Who is better, the angels or, the, or, the, or, or mankind? Who is better, the angels or mankind? Right, so this great creation, they lower their wings for the scholars. They lower their wings for the scholars out of respect. Out of respect and out of greatness for the scholars, the angels lower their wings. The angels lower their wings. And some of the ulama of the past, such as Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Malik bin Anas, who died 179 Hijri, Imam Malik bin Anas said, it doesn't mean that the angels lower their wings. But what is meant is that the angels supplicate for the scholars. But what is meant is that the angels, they supplicate for the scholars. But some of the ulama said that. They said, in fact, the angels lower their wings. In fact, the angels lower their wings. But whether it's what Imam Malik said, or whether it's what some of the other scholars said, both of them show the marks of the scholars. Whether the angels, in fact, lower their wings out of respect for the scholars, or whether the angels supplicate for the scholars, both of them show the merits of the scholars. Whether you take this tafsir, or whether you take that, that tafsir, both of them show the greatness and the merits and the statue of the scholars in Islam. The next sentence where the Prophet said, where the Prophet said, where the Prophet said, 
من في الأرض من في السماوات ومن في الأرض حتى الحيتان في البحر أو حتى الحيتان في الماء The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم And verily and verily everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholars everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholars even even the fish in the sea even the fish in the sea there's no doubt that this hadith or this portion of the hadith also continues to show the great merit, merits of the scholars in Islam that everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for this individual seeks forgiveness for this individual and we know, you know, uh, a normal Muslim or the, the, the regular layman Muslim he seeks forgiveness for himself his wife might seek forgiveness for him his children, as the Prophet Sallallahu said when a person dies, his, all of his actions are cut off except three then one of them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned a righteous son to make dua for you a righteous son to make dua for you so the general layman he makes forgiveness or he seeks forgiveness for himself his children seek, his righteous children seek forgiveness for him his wife might seek forgiveness for him and we hope that our wives seek forgiveness for us the, his brothers, his Muslim brothers, they might seek forgiveness for him seek forgiveness for him five, but everything in the heavens and everything in the earth everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholars so the general layman, he has a few people he has a few individuals that seek forgiveness for him but the scholar, everything seeks forgiveness for him the Prophet said, even, even the fish in the sea even the fish in the sea seeks forgiveness for the scholar seeks forgiveness for the scholar this without a doubt shows the greatness of the scholars this without a doubt shows the greatness of the scholars and the merits of the scholars and the ulema mentioned in their various books that one of the reasons why one of the reasons why uh, everything in the heavens and everything in the earth seeks forgiveness for the scholars is because the scholars clarify to the people that which is halal and that which is haram right? from, the, from, the, from the occupation from the jobs of the scholars is that they clarify to the people that which is halal and that which is haram and they enjoin the good upon the people and they forbid the evil they enjoin the good and they forbid the evil so you have tranquility so you have tranquility and you have order on the earth so you have tranquility and you have order on the earth and everything is affected when the scholars do their job enjoin the good, forbid the evil teach the people, advise the people when they do their job, you have, and everything is affected with this good which is the result of the scholars everything is affected you don't have the people, Muslim, you don't have the people committing crimes you don't have, because they enjoy and they forbid they teach, you don't have people committing crimes against Allah you don't have people uh, teaching that which is evil you don't have that because the scholars are doing their jobs and all good comes about and all good comes about so all of that good that comes about in the heavens and in the earth, in the sea and the likes of that these things take it upon themselves to seek forgiveness for the scholars because they have received only good because everything in the heavens and everything in earth has only received good but when the opposite takes place when the opposite takes place, when there's no scholars when there's no people to teach the people when there's no individuals to teach the people when there's no people to tell, this is halal, this is haram when there's no people to tell, no, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that then only bad comes about then only evil comes about then only facade spreads through the earth so everything is affected by the evil so everything is affected by the evil so because of the presence of the scholars and the teaching of the scholars and the good that comes about, that trickles down upon the creation, upon the land upon the animals, upon everything, the good that trickles down from the teaching of the scholars everything wants to give and return good so they make forgiveness, so they seek forgiveness for the scholars but when the scholars are not present when the scholars are not present and the job is not being done only evil comes down only evil comes down so this shows without a doubt the greatness uh, of the scholars and then continuing with the hadith the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said وَإِنَّ فَضْلَ الْعَالِمْ عَلَى الْعَابِدْ كَالْقَمَرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْقَوَاتِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and the greatness of the scholar to the regular worshipper the greatness of the scholar to the regular worshipper is like the greatness of the moon compared to the stars the greatness of the moon compared to the stars and this can be taken in several ways this can be taken in several ways 
From them is if you look at the moon, look at the size of the moon. And look at the size of the stars. Right? The moon is without a doubt greater and larger than the stars. Right? That's one way. So this is the merit of the scholar compared to the greatness of the, star, of the scholar compared to the regular layman. Another thing the scholars say, the light of the moon. The light of the moon illuminates everything. The light of the moon falls on everything. Unless there's a hindrance, unless there's a barrier, the light of the moon falls on everything. Whereas the light of the star is very small. The light of the star is very small. The same way with the scholar. Everyone who is around the scholar is benefited. Everyone, yani the knowledge that comes from the scholar falls on everyone. The people, unless there's a hindrance, unless people have uh, barriers on their hearts or the likes of that, unless that is the case, but everyone benefits from the knowledge of the scholar. When the scholar teaches, when the books are written, when the talks take place on the phone and on PowerPoint and the likes of that, when all of this takes place, yani the knowledge falls on everyone. The knowledge falls on everyone. This is the example of the scholar. This is the example of the scholar. His knowledge affects and falls on everyone. It affects and falls on everyone. Whereas the, the worshiper, the worshiper, like Mother and me, if I get up, if I get up at night and I pray, I only benefit myself. If I fast on Mondays and Thursdays and Ramadan, I only benefit myself. Right? So the worship that an individual, the, the worship that an individual layman does only benefits himself. Whereas the knowledge and the occupation and that which is dispersed from the scholar benefits everyone. It benefits everyone. So this is uh, the merits of the scholar compared to the general layman. There's other things, there's other things that we're going to uh, shed some light on this particular point before we go to another to other hadith, or before we go to other benefits. And that is, there's another hadith, there's another hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that shows you the greatness of the scholar over the layman. Over the layman. And that's the well-known hadith. The hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. In uh, Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs, because we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to tell us, used to tell the Sahaba stories of the people of the past. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to tell the Sahaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to tell the Sahaba of stories of the past so that they can, you know, reflect. So that they can reflect and contemplate over these particular stories. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed in the hadith. In the hadith of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, informed about a man that came before. And he said, there was a man before you, there was a man before you that killed 99 people. There was a man before you that killed 99 people. And he wanted to make toba. And he wanted to make toba. So he axed around the city. He was a murderer. He axed around the city about who can inform him how to make toba. And there's several benefits from that particular point. Before we even continue, that shows you the importance of seeking knowledge. Because even that murderer did not take it upon himself. But he wanted to know how. Even that murderer did not take it upon himself. But he wanted to know how. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated that Allah is the only one to be worshipped. And this is a serious point. Allah legislated that he's the only one to be worshipped. And Allah legislated how he is worshipped. And the worship of Allah is not based off of the intellect of mankind. Right? So even that murderer... Even that murderer wanted to seek knowledge on how to make Toba to Allah Azza So he went around the city and he asked, How? I want to make Toba, inform me how. So they guided him, the people of the city, they guided him to a monk. They guided him to a worshipper. So he went to that worshipper. A person that indulges in worship, doesn't seek knowledge, and likes, but a person that just indulges in worship, spends his time in worship. So he was guided to a monk, a worshiper. So he went to that monk and he explained to him, you know, I'm an individual, you know, I've had my past, I've had my, you know, I've killed 99 people. I want to make toba. Can I make toba? The worshiper with his ignorance said, no. So he said, if that's the case, I'm going to kill you. And he killed him too. If that's the case, you don't, you, know, you don't tell a murderer he can't make toba. Right? You tell a murderer that which he wants to know. So this... Uh, this monk, this worshipper, with, with lack of knowledge, with lack of knowledge, he said to the murderer, no, no. 
So the murderer said, if that's the case, I'm getting rid of you as well. So he completed 100. So he completed 100. After some time, he felt the need to make Tawbah again. And this is the way of the Abd. This is the way of the Abd, that we always feel the need to make Tawbah. And we don't, and it comes to a point where we stop making Tawbah. Because once you come to the point where you stop making Tawbah, then that's your destruction. And that's your destruction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept it from you until Yom al or until your death. Until Yom al or until your death. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the doors of Tawbah are open until Yom al or in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, until the sun rises from, until the sun rises from the west. Right? So, this is the, the way of the abd. And this was the way of this murderer. After some time, he wanted to make Tawbah again. He felt the need to make Tawbah again. So this time, he went around the city and he asked the same thing. You know, I want to make, I want to make Tawbah. Inform me how. So they guided him this time to a scholar. So the second time, they guided him to a scholar. They guided him to a scholar. And they said, uh, so he went to the scholar. He said to the scholar, I'm an individual that has killed 100 people. And my affair is not light. And you're not talking to any, any individual. I want to make Toba. How should I go about it? Can I do it? The scholar said to him, what would stop you? What would, what would divert you from Toba? What would stop you from make, making Toba? Right, this is a scholar, so he knows. He knows that uh, the doors of Tawbah are open. He understands. He has knowledge in his religion. So he says, what will stop you? But that which you must do is you must leave this land. That which you must do, you must leave this land. And you must go to another land where the people worship Allah. Stay there and worship Allah with them. And do not return to this land. And do not return to this land because this is an evil land. This is another benefit, the benefit of making hijrah. The benefit of making hijrah, especially from the lands of sins. Especially from the lands of sins. Right? And we know to the end of the hadith where the individual went and he died on the road toward the end of the hadith. Right. So in this hadith, the ulama used to show the greatness of a scholar over a layman. The greatness of a scholar over a layman. That the scholar, when they have knowledge, they have understanding, they have thick in the religion of Allah, that this would bring about life. Just as it brought about, the, the scholar lived on. But the monk died because of his ignorance. Because of his ignorance. There's another narration in that regard, to show the merit of the merits of the scholar, and the same, the same, the merits of the scholar over the general layman. And that is narrated by Ibn Abdul Baf, one of the scholars of the past, one of the Maliki scholars of the past, Ibn Abdul Baf, Al Hafiz, Ibn Abdul Baf, Rahimullah Ta'ala, in his book, Jami' uh, Bayan and Elm wa He has a book called uh, A Gathering of the Merits of Knowledge, of the Merits of Knowledge, A Gathering of uh, a Compilation of the Merits of Knowledge. He mentioned a narration on Ibn Abbas, Abdullah bin Abbas, which is the cousin of the Prophet wasallam. And that narration was, uh, the shayateen, the shayateen, the different devils and the likes, they came to the, the greatest one, the shaytan. They went to the shaytan one day. And they said to him, مَا نَرَاكَ أَوْ لِمَاذَا نَرَاكَ تَفْرَهُ بِمَوْتِ الْعَالَمْ مَا لَا تَفْرَهُ بِمَوْتِ الْعَابِدِ they said to the shaitan, the shaitan, the greatest shaitan. They said to him, why do we see you uh, rejoicing and being happy when a scholar dies, but you don't do the same when, when a worshiper dies? But you don't do the same thing, you don't have that same rejoice and happiness when a worshiper dies. So he says to them, in falaq. He said to them, in falaq. He said to them, let's go. He wanted to show them. So they went to a worshipper. And we know the shayateen have the ability to change their appearance. We know the shayateen have the ability to change their appearance. So the shaytan took his students, which informs you that he teaches as well. The shaytan took his students, the shayateen, to a worshipper that was praying. And they came to him in the form of a man. All of them, the shayateen and the shaytan. And they said to the, they said to, uh, the abbot, the shaitan ordered them to say to the abbot, tell him you want to ask him a question. So they said to this worshipper, while he was praying, we want to ask you a question. So he stopped praying. He stopped praying and he said, what, what can I help you with? So they said to him, or the shaitan, not the shaitan took over. The shaitan said, I want to know, 
does Allah have the ability to put the dunya into the, the belly of an egg? The shaitan said to this abbot, I want to know, does Allah have the ability to put the dunya, the world, into the inside, the belly of an egg? And the abbot, with his ignorance, said no. He said no. So the shaitan turned towards his students and said, see how he is a kafir? See how he's a kafir? He's denying the ability of Allah. And we know, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَادِرٌ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ We know that Allah is able to do anything. So the shaitan looked at his students, he said, see how he's a kafir? And you see how his ignorance led to his disbelief? See how his ignorance led to his disbelief? ثُمَّ جَاءُوا إِلَىٰ عَالَمٍ Then they went to a scholar. They went to a scholar. The shaitan said to them, say the same thing. Ask him the same thing. So they said, we want to ask you. They went to a scholar, and actually the scholar was sitting, teaching some individuals. And he was laughing with them, and he was teaching them and laughing with them. So the shaitan says, ask him the same thing. So they said to him, we, 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 we want to ask you a question. So he turned to them, and he said, ask. So they're in the form of men. He said, ask. So the shaitan took over now. He said, I want to know. Does Allah have the ability to put the dunya in the belly of an egg, in the, the, the inner, the, 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 the inside of an egg? And the scholar said, yes. And the shaitan said, how? The scholar said, yaqulu kun fa yaqul. He said, is, be, and it is. Allah says, be, and it is. So the shaitan looked at his students and he said, you see the problem with this one? You see the problem with this one? He's making my job difficult. <laughs> He's making my job difficult. So this shows the, you know, that narration and the previous one shows the greatness of the scholar over the general layman. The greatness of the scholar over the general layman. And continuing with the same hadith, uh, and forgive me, I hope that the brothers are, are patient because I know it's, 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 it's a long speech. And I said it's a, it's, it's a speech that can take hours. A speech that can take hours. So we're just trying to shed some light on the subject so we see the importance of having connection, having a relationship with these type of individuals, these scholars. Uh, the questions are at the end of the time. Uh, the brothers that are in charge. No. So I, I'm, I'm allowed to delay because I'm a traveler. But I don't know about the brothers. So in a few minutes or so. Right. Another thing, or continue with the same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرَثَةَ الْأَنْبِيَةَ And verily the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. Verily the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. And the Prophets did not leave back. The Prophets did not leave back wealth. But they left back knowledge. Time. This also informs about the greatness and the merit of the scholars. And that is because it shows that the scholars have taken on the occupation of the Prophets. The scholars have in fact taken on the occupation of the Prophets. And we know the occupation of the Prophets is great because it is informing about Allah, teaching the people about Allah, the Book of Allah, the legislation of Allah, the Halal, the Haram. Any, the, the occupation of the scholars, often the occupation of the Prophets is the greatest of occupations. No person, whether that's an engineer, whether that's a doctor, whether that's a, uh, a rocket scientist, has an occupation like the occupation of the prophets. And no one has trials like the trials of the prophets. The people going against them, the people throwing them out, the people beating them, the people killing them. Right? In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. And the prophets did not leave back wealth. They did not leave back wealth, but they left back knowledge. So this hadith shows you that the scholars have taken upon their shoulders the occupation of the prophets. And this is something as well we understand. Because after Allah Azza took the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's no more messengers that are going to come with a new leg legislation. There's no more messengers that are going to come with a new legislation. But, but people will be held accountable for following the present legislation. Five, who's going to clarify that there's no more prophets? The scholars. Who's going to say, this is halal, this is haram, this is what Allah means, this is the understanding of the hadith. There's no more prophets that are going to come and clarify it to the people. We understand that Allah Taala says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We will not punish the people until we, until we send a messenger. We will not punish the people until we send a messenger. Hi, there's a long span between the Prophet Muhammad and Yawm Al-Qiyamah. 
the long span between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Yom Kiyamah. But Allah still, Allah as a result, is still going to judge the people and hold them accountable. So that means that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala placed from the mercy of Allah, Allah placed individuals that would clarify to the people their religion because we're going to be held accountable, and the religion cannot be lost. It cannot be lost because Allah will not judge people when something is lost. Allah Azza wa Jalla will not judge people when something is lost. So the religion is qa'in. So the religion is there. The book of Allah Azza wa Jalla is being protected. The son of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being protected. And the individuals that protect it are the scholars. The individuals that protect it are the scholars. Another thing that it shows is the relationship between the scholars and the prophets. Because your inheritance when you die, it goes to your closest relatives. Al-Waratha, our tariqa, when somebody dies, his inheritance goes to his closest relative. So when if the Prophet ﷺ said that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, that shows you the close relationship between the prophets and the scholars. Because when you die, your inheritance goes to the closest person to you. And when the Prophet ﷺ died, when the Prophet ﷺ died, when Allah Taala took him, as it was, uh, took him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the knowledge went to the closest people to him. The closest people to him. And that was the scholars from amongst the Sahaba. And that was the scholars from amongst the Sahaba. And when they died, it went to the closest people to them. The scholars from amongst the Tabi'in. And it will continue until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree comes about. So there's no doubt that this shows the greatness and the merits of the scholars in Islam. The greatness and the merits of the scholars in Islam. And with that in mind, we want, there's, there's much more that we wanted to mention, but we don't want to, uh, uh, we want to save some time. With that in mind, it is not from uh, a person that has aqal. It is not from a person that has intellect. That these individuals are still present. That these individuals are still present, and that person goes without them. And that person goes without them. Yani, that the scholars are still present. Alhamdulillah, from the mercy of Allah, is that Allah has placed individuals that are still present to protect, protect the religion, to guide the people in the religion. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, There will always be a group of my ummah that will be upon the truth. There will always be a group of my ummah upon the truth. La na'am, la yazurruhum. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La tazalu al haq. لا يضرهم من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله وهم كذلك. There will always be a group of my ummah that are upon the truth. They will not be disturbed by those who go against them until the order of Allah comes. And until before Yom Al-Qiyamah. So there are groups. There are groups. There still are scholars at present to clarify to the people their religion. There still are scholars present to guide the people in their religion. So is it possible that the scholars are present? The scholars are, are on the earth and individuals act like they don't need them. Individuals act like they're free of them. Individuals act like they're sufficient, self-sufficient, and they are in no need of these scholars. So these are the individuals that clarify to the people the religion. These are the indi- individuals that uh, explain to the people the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. An example of that, the example of that is an example that was mentioned by Abu Bakr al azurzi one of the salaf of the past, uh, who came after the time of Imam Ahmed, after the time of Imam Ahmed. He has a book called the, the, the Character of the Scholars. In that, he struck an example. And he said the example of a scholar to mankind is the example of a group of people. The example of a group of people that went out one day. And they entered حتى دخلوا في وابي. And they entered into a valley. And when they went into the valley, the sun set. They went into the valley and the sun set. And none of them has light. None of them has any form of light. And being that it's a valley, and notice the dikkah to fit the shit. Notice the, 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 the intricate knowledge of the shit when he's mentioning this example. Because a valley, remember we said the, 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 the moon, and the moon lights up everything except if there's a hindrance. A valley is difficult for them, and it's difficult for you to have light in a valley because a valley is surrounded by mountains. Because a valley is surrounded by mountains. So it's not like you have the moonlight coming in. Not like you have the moonlight coming in. Yani there's, it's possibly that the mountains are hindering, hindering the light of the moon. So he said, so a group of people enter into a valley and the sun sets. And none of them was prepared for this. None of them has any type of lanterns, any type of lights. And they're walking. 
They don't know the front from the back, from the left from the right. They don't know nothing. And it's absolute darkness. Absolute darkness. In the valley, the place where the, the moon doesn't reach. And then someone comes walking with a lantern. And then someone comes walking with a lantern. He meets up with them and he guides them all out of the valley. He said, this is the example of the scholar amongst the people. This is the example of the scholar amongst the people. He has the knowledge. He has the understanding. The people are in darkness and he guides them out of the darkness into the light. And he guides them out of the darkness into the light. Five years ago. There's no doubt we today are in darkness. We are in darkness of sin, darkness of shirk, darkness of uh, 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 jahal, ignorance, and the likes of that. The scholars are present. And verily, Allah Azza wa has given them the light. Allah Azza wa has given them the light. The scholars of Ahl al-Sunnah. It is upon us, all of us, to take advantage of that light which the scholars have. It's upon all of us to take advantage of that light which Allah Azza wa Ta'ala has blessed those individuals with. With that, we close, we close the talk. We ask Allah Azza wa Ta'ala to give us understanding of our religion. We ask Allah Azza wa Ta'ala to preserve our scholars. We ask Allah Azza wa Ta'ala to give us the means of benefiting from them in this life as well as in the hereafter. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. طيب you brothers want to pray first and then ask questions؟ إن شاء الله إن we're going to start the question and answer session. We're going to allow uh, 20 minutes, inshallah, for questions. We would ask that the uh, first questions be dealing with the topic, and the majority of questions will be dealing with the topic, and any other questions to be dealing with after that, inshallah. But please, uh, we're going to allow 20 minutes, inshallah. And we ask that the sisters uh, write the questions down and have those questions brought up to us, and uh, we'll proceed, inshallah. Five. There's a lot of things mentioned in your question. <laughs> but uh, the first thing was you, you thanked me for uh, making this the topic. But that thanks you for the brothers because they made it the topic. Um, in terms of the individual that says there, there's no status present, then some of the stuff that I mentioned in the, in the talk to deal with that, and some of the, uh, like the hadith I mentioned, the Prophet said there will always be, the always be a group of my ummah upon the truth. Always be a group of my ummah upon the truth. That is there. As well as um, the fact that it's understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not punish the people unless they, you know, are given a sense of message. But it's also understood that the Prophet said, Ana khatim al nabiyin la nabiyya ba'd. I'm the last of, I'm the seal of the prophets, there's no prophet after me. And we know uh, uh, every messenger is a prophet, and not every prophet is, and not the opposite. Every messenger is a prophet, and not every prophet is a messenger. So the Prophet so some, uh, and the reason why I mentioned that hadith is because some said, the Prophet said, I am the last of prophets. 
I'm the last of uh, prophets, right? But I'm not the, you know, and they don't say, he didn't say the last of messengers. Five, but it's the same thing. Five, but it's the same thing. Five, so uh, there's no messenger after the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no messenger after the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if that's the case, and Allah will not punish the people until they know, then how are the people of today supposed to know? So from the time, and then you can ask that individual, when did the last scholar, there's no scholars today, when did the last scholar die? Five. From that time, from that time to Yom Kiyama, Allah can't judge these people. Allah can't, Allah can't judge these people because the message is lost. If you're saying that there's nothing being proven, or if there's nothing being taught, there's no one explaining to the people. So from that time to Yom Kiyama, Allah can't punish the people. Because Allah will not punish the people until they uh, are given a proof. And so, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا And we would not punish the people until we send a message. Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing is, when you do inform them of the names of certain scholars, you have scholars in Saudi Arabia, you have scholars in Yemen, you have scholars in Jordan, you have scholars, you have scholars. Right? So, when you mention Mathur and Sheikh Salah al Fawzan or Sheikh bin Bas, you say Sheikh bin Bas Mathur, and he says, okay, it's only, it's only Saudi Arabia. You say, no, Taib, Yemen. Sheikh Muqtur, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Oh, Taib, only Yemen? He said, no, you have Egypt, Sheikh Hassan al Banna, Sheikh Hassan al Banna of today, not the Hassan al Banna of the past. And the like. So there's other places that you have scholars. But even if it was, even if it was only Saudi Arabia, now, and this is the, we, we try to our best to implement the ways of the Ibn Taymiyyah, rahim Allah Ta'ala, in argumentation or debating. And that is to cut an individual off from being able to respond. And that is, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowledge was with who? The Sahaba. Five? Five. Were there people in other places in the world? Of course, the answer is yes. There were people in Africa, there were people in Yemen, there were people. But the knowledge was only with a group of people. And that was the Sahaba. So what's the ghari, what's strange with knowledge only being with a group of people? Because the beginning of the affair, knowledge started with only a group of people, and that was, that was the Sahaba. And the only way a tabi'i, the only way, or the only people that a tabi'i could seek knowledge with was with the Sahaba. Is that understood? So there were times through history, there were times through history that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected a group of people that had the knowledge. That had the knowledge. You had that in history. And no individual can argue that. Because the only people that took from the Messenger of Allah was the Sahaba. And if anyone wanted to learn anywhere in the world, they had to take from the Sahaba. They had to take from the Sahaba, which is a group of people. Which is a group of people. It wasn't possible that a tabi could see knowledge by himself. As Muhammad bin Sareen mentioned, Rahimullah ta'ala, in the hadha deen al in the heaven, Elbin, Fandur, Amma Tahudu Dinakum. Very, this, this, this uh, knowledge is your religion. So look towards who you take your knowledge from. So they used to take knowledge from the Sahaba. The Tabi'in used to take knowledge from the Sahaba. And then those who came after them, the Atba'a at Tabi'in, took knowledge from the Tabi'in. Right? So, yes, it was particular, it was particular, or it was in that period of time, and other periods of time in history that you had, there were only a group of people that had knowledge. And the most, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is not asked about that which He does, but we are asked. So if Allah Taala places knowledge, authentic knowledge with a group of people, if Allah Azawajal chooses, if Allah Taala is not asked about what He does, if Allah chooses to place knowledge with a group of people, and anyone that wants to seek knowledge has to seek it from that group of people, then Allah is not asked about what He does. Because the Tabi'een did not have a problem with only seeking knowledge from the Sahaba. And the Atba'i at Tabi'in did not only have a problem with seeking knowledge from the, uh, the Tabi'in, from the, from the tabi Before that, before that, when mankind was astray, let's say mankind was astray during the time of, after Adam alayhi salatu salam, after Adam alayhi salatu salam, and generations went on, and generations went on and people went astray. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent who? Nuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Nuh alayhi salatu salam. Five. Anyone after the Prophet Noah that wanted to be guided astray, they had to go through who? One man. They had to go through one man, Noah. And there was no other way to Allah, 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 Allah,
after the death of uh, Adam alayhi salatu salam, there was no other way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Noah except through Noah. Through one man, not through a group of people, not through a country, through one man. Five, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places knowledge in one individual or a group of individuals or a particular country and the likes of that, Allah is not asked about what he does. And the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that. From time to time Allah does that. But that's not the case now. It's not the case now. You have knowledge in Saudi Arabia. You have knowledge in Yemen, you have knowledge in Jordan, you have knowledge in Kuwait, you have knowledge in Egypt, you have knowledge. Alhamdulillah. A list of scholars. Can you email them? I can I can name some and then I can and then the brothers can handle the rest. Uh, the scholars of our times, the scholars of our times, Sheikh Ben Bar, Sheikh Hussaini, Sheikh Al Albani, Sheikh Muslim. And let me mention the, the order that they died: Sheikh Ben Bar, Sheikh Al Albani, Sheikh Hussaini, Sheikh Muslim. Those are the greatest scholars of our times. Those four scholars. Once again, Sheikh Ben Bar. After Sheikh Ben Bar died, Rahimullah Taala, Sheikh Al Albani died. After Sheikh Al Albani died, Rahimullah Taala, Sheikh Hussaini died. After Sheikh Uthaymin died, Sheikh Mutwa died. And that's an example of what you mentioned. The Sheikh Ben Bas and Sheikh Uthaymin, they're from Saudi. Sheikh Al-Bani was from Albania, which is in Europe. And Sheikh Mutwa was from Yemen. So that also shows you a spread of knowledge. Okay, those were the four greats of our time. You know, without a doubt, Ahlul Sunnah, the people that followed the Sunnah, uh, those are the four great scholars of our time. And then after them come their students of today. You have Sheikh Salah Al-Fawzan. You have the, the present Mufti of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Sheikh, who is from the family of Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab. You have uh, I mentioned Sheikh Saad Al Fawzan. You have Sheikh Hubayr Al Jabari in, in Al Medina. You have uh, Sheikh Ali Nasr Al Fatihi in Al Medina. You have Sheikh Abdul Musan Al Abad, who is my Sheikh in Al Medina. You have Sheikh Saad Al Fahimi in Al Medina. Then you go down to Mecca, in Mecca you have Sheikh Rabia Min Hadi Al Madkhali. You have Sheikh Ushila, Sheikh Ushila Al Abbasi, who's from India. You have Sheikh Adam Al Ethiopi, who's from Ethiopia. You have um, the, the, the two brothers from the Basmo family. And then, if you want to come out of Saudi Arabia, just for uh, clarity, you have Sheikh Yahya Hajuri, who's from the students of Sheikh Mukhtar in Yemen. In Yemen, you have Sheikh Mohammed Imam. You have Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab Al Wasabi in Yemen. You know, so the scholars are still present, alhamdulillah. The scholars are still present. And it's a part of people to take advantage of them, because the scholars are dying. You know, the scholars are dying. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith, uh, the hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُنْزِعُ الْإِلْمَ إِنْتِزَاعًا مِنْ شُدُورُ الرِّجَاءِ وَلَكِنَّهُ يُنْزِعُهُ بِمَوْتٍ عُلَمَاء حَتَّى إِذَا لَمْ يَبْقَى عَالِمٌ اتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ رُؤُوسًا جُحَالًا Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah will not rip the knowledge, He will not take the knowledge from the chest of the men. But Allah will take the knowledge by the dying off of the scholars. Allah will take the knowledge away by the dying off of the scholars. Until none of them remain. And then the people take the ignorant as their leaders, they ask them questions, they are guided this way and they lead other people astray. They are guided this way and they lead other people astray. And we see like those four scholars that I mentioned, all of them died in a period of two years. So the Baz died, a few months after that, Sheikh Al-Bani died. A few months after that, Sheikh Uthaymi died. A few months after that, Sheikh Musul died. You know, so it's important that we take advantage of the, still, the scholars that are still here. We take advantage of them. And none of them are in America. If you understand, none of them are in America. You have them in Yemen. You have them in Saudi Arabia. You have them in Jordan. You have them in Egypt. And the likes of that, you have them in Kuwait. But you don't have them in, in America. You don't have them in America. Which leads to another point. Which leads to another point. And that is... It's important that we are cautious where we take our knowledge from. It's important that we are cautious where we take our knowledge from. And that is, uh, in, we take our knowledge from individuals. And we have that statement from Ibn Shireen. From amongst those statements, لَمْ يَكُونُ يَشْعَنُ عَنِ الْإِسْنَادِ حَتَّى وَقَعَتِ الْفِتْنَةِ فَإِذَا فَلَمَّا وَقَعَتِ الْفِتْنَةِ سَأَلُوا وَنَظَرُوا فَنَظَرُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلَ السُنَّةِ وَأَخَذَ مِنْهُمْ الْعِلْمِ وَنَظَرُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلَ الْبِدَى وَفَرَقَ الْعِلْمِ وَفَرَقَ وَفَرَقَهُمْ Muhammad bin Shireen also said that they, it was a time they wouldn't ask about where the knowledge is coming from. It was a time that they wouldn't ask about where the knowledge is coming from because the people were trustworthy. Because the people were trustworthy. Until fitna took place in the Muslim Ummah. 
after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the assassination of many of the Sahaba, fitting took place. So then they begin to ask where this knowledge is coming from. Then they begin to ask where is this knowledge coming from. And they will look to the people of the Sunnah. They will look to the people that were stern and strict upon uh, their adherence to the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to talk about that. They will look at these people, they will take from them. And they will look to the people that were not upon that and they would leave them. And they would leave them. And so in that hadith you find that it's important that a person is cautious where he takes his knowledge from. Where he takes his knowledge from. After, after the sickness took place in the Muslim Ummah, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was known that he should ask about your knowledge. Where is this coming from? Is this authentic? Is this correct? Did he really say it? Even during the time of the Sahaba. Even during the time of the Sahaba, it wasn't that they tr- didn't trust one another. Alhamdulillah. Because the Sahaba are all trustworthy. It wasn't that they didn't trust one another, but just to be sure, it was correct. Just to be sure, it was correct. You had examples of the Sahaba being cautious where knowledge was coming from. From those examples, the hadith of Umar bin Khattab in Sahih al-Bukhari, where he ordered uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to come to his house. And this was after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa After the death of the Prophet, after the death of Abu Bakr, you had Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala. Umar bin Khattab uh, uh, ordered one of the Sahaba to come to his house. He had something he wanted to inform him. That Sahaba's name was Abu Musa al-Ashari. So Abu Musa al-Ashari came to Umar bin Khattab's house. And he knocked once. Umar didn't answer. He knocked twice. Umar didn't answer. He knocked the third time. Umar didn't answer. He left. Umar bin Khattab came out of his house because he was busy. He heard the knocks but he was busy. He was involved in something. So he came out of his house. Abdullah, uh, uh, Abu Musa al-Ashari had left. So his name, his kun is Abu Musa al-Ashari. His name is Abdullah bin Qais. So he had left. So Umar bin Khattab looked around and said, did, did I not hear uh, Abdullah bin Qais, who was Abu Musa al-Ashari, did I not hear him knocking at my door? And he said, a few minutes ago. They said, yes, but he left. He knocked three times. You didn't answer, he left. So Umar bin Khattab said, call, call him for me. Bring him, bring, him, bring him to me. Tell him to come. So uh, Abu Musa al-Ashari came back. So Umar bin Khattab said, uh, you knocked at my door, I was busy, you knocked at three times, why did you leave? He said, because I heard the message, Abdullah bin Qais, who is Abu Musa al-Asri, and his kunya, Abu Musa al-Asri, his name is Abdullah bin Qais. He said, I heard the message say, al-isti'adhanus salah, seeking permission is free. If the person answers, then enter. If not, leave. Umar bin Khattab said, you better bring me somebody that bears witness the message of that. <laughs> we know Umar bin Khattab is, is a serious individual. He said, you better bring somebody that bears witness that the messenger said that. So Allah, Abu Musa al-Ashari, he's upset, he's worried, he walks. Umar. So he went up to the Sahaba, and he said to them, uh, Umar bin Khattab, does, you know, he, 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 I, I need a witness, I need somebody that heard the messenger said this said the Sahabi. So the Sahaba, they said, send Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, because he's young. To show Umar that it's possible that you missed a few things. It's possible that some things that you, you missed. So they sent Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went to Abu Musa al-Ashari, and they went to Umar bin Khattab, and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, yes, I heard the messenger say the same thing. So Umar bin Khattab, he said, my, my busy, my, my work must have hindered me from hearing this from the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa So this shows that even during the time of the Sahaba, they were cautious. They were cautious. Not that they did not trust one another, but they wanted to make sure. They wanted to make sure. So even now today, it's very important that an individual, a Muslim, who wants good in his religion, is cautious who he takes knowledge from. He's cautious who he takes knowledge from. He doesn't seek it from anybody. When a person comes from with knowledge, where did you study? Where did you hear this from? Uh, what hadith was that mentioned in? Who narrated the hadith? What book of hadith can I find that in? He's very cautious where you take knowledge from. And then to find that nowadays you have individuals that must have live here in America and have high positions, high positions as uh, leaders, and they haven't gone abroad to study. They don't speak Arabic. They can't recite Fatiha correctly. They never sat with the scholars. Yani, you notice in the hadith that we mentioned in the lecture, the Prophet Sallallahu said there were people that inherited from the prophets. There were people that inherited from the prophets, and that was the scholars. And that was the scholars. إِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءُ وَرَثَةُ الْأَمْلِيَةِ Verily, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. That means there's something going down. It's given from one to the other. From the prophets to the scholars. 
from the scholars to the students, from the students to the people. So it's something trickling down like inheritance. It goes from my father to me, from me to my son, from my son to his son. So it goes from person to person. It goes from person to person. And you have individuals that wake up one day, one morning, I want to be a scholar. He opens up the Quran class, I'm a scholar. And at Fajr, I was ignorant. At Isha, I'm a scholar. And this is the case. And then you have individuals that take from these type of people. The Prophet showed us some wonders of this. He was said that the scholars would die off. The scholars would die off. The ignorant would remain. The ignorant would remain. The people would take those as their leaders. The people would take those as their leaders. So as the scholars, and I ask my brothers and my sisters, by Allah, as the scholars are still present on the earth, as the scholars are still present on the earth, take from those individuals. Take from those individuals. And then you had a ta'rif, you had a, a definition that was given by some of the scholars for the scholars, or some of the, the scholars of the scholars, where they said, the scholars, هم العالمون بشرع الله المتفقهون في الدين الذين الذين يعبلون على الهدى والبصيرة وتمسكوا بسنة الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. They said, these scholars are the ones that have knowledge of the religion of Allah. They have understanding of that which is legislated. They act upon knowledge and clarity and they stick to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they stick to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there are several things in there to show you what is a scholar. A person that has knowledge. Where did he get his knowledge? A person that has thick understanding. Thick understanding. A person that acts upon what he knows. A person that acts upon what he knows. A person that sticks to the sunnah. A person that sticks to the sunnah. And you have you have the statements of the Salaf from a Muslim, Imam al-Shafi, Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi, who died 204 Hijri, where he said, Akhi, lan tanal al-ilma illa bi shittatan. He said it in poetry. Akhi, lan tanal al-ilma illa bi shittatan. Sa'unabbi'uka bi ta'wilihi wa bayani. Zaka'un, hirsun, wa ishtihadun, wa bulbatun, wa suhbatun, ustadi, wa tuli zamani. Imam al-Shafi, rahim Allah ta'ala, said, My brother, you will never obtain knowledge, except with six. I'm going to inform you about them and clarify them to you. My brother, you will never obtain knowledge except with six. I'm going to inform you about them and clarify them to you. The ka'un. And a person has intellect. Wahirsun. A person has desire. Wajtihadun. A person has the, the, the effort. He has the effort to go out and seek. Wabulratun. The person has the means. He has the wealth. The means to seek it. Wasuhbatun ustad. He has a teacher. He has a teacher. وطول الزمان and he does it for a long time and he does it for a long time person cannot seek knowledge the person does not seek knowledge without a teacher the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a teacher who was his teacher? Jibreel Alayhi Salaam the Sahaba they had a teacher who was their teacher? the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's the way it goes the individual doesn't open up a book and become a scholar by himself he doesn't open up a book and become a scholar by himself so this is a, another thing that was very important so, you should have a teacher. You should have a teacher. The brothers mentioning, I mean, when we study from the scholars, is it sufficient to have a book, or do we have to refer to the scholars, refer back to the scholars? Reading from a book is good. Reading from a book is good, but. There's no doubt a person is going to come through ishkalat, problems, questions. So when you come to those questions, if it was the case that only the books were present, that's all we can go back to. But the scholars are present. So what an individual Muslim in America does, is he doesn't have the ability to travel. Because notice, the Prophet it could have been easy. And we always take it back to the ways of the Prophets. It could have been easy for Allah to send down a book and tell the people to read. It would be easy for Allah to send down a book and tell the people to read. But Allah sent down a book through a messenger. Allah sent it down through Jibreel. Jibreel sent it down to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Sahaba took it from the tongue of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where it could have been easy for Allah to send down a book. But Allah sent it down through a messenger to explain to the people. To explain to the people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Ra. كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah said, a book that we have sent down to you, 
a book that we have sent down to you, the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so that you can guide the people from darkness to the light, by the permission of Allah, to the straight path. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent it down through a messenger. Allah Azza wa Jalla sent it down through a messenger, so he ex- can explain to the people when they don't understand. So books are good. Books are good. But if a person comes to a point where he doesn't understand, he, has, he needs a scholar to refer to. He needs a scholar that he can refer to. So why the scholars are present? And if the Sahaba, they could have, yani, or the Tabi'een, they could have took the book, they could have took the Quran and said, Come on, this is sufficient, we don't need the Sahaba. But not. you have to take it, because there's going to be points you don't understand. There's going to be things you don't understand. And that's where you need a scholar. And that's where you need a scholar. The last days. The question is, could you please explain the hadith, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and others, that during the latter day there will be 50 women to one man. Does that mean uh, that, does that mean 50 Muslim women? The hadith is, the hadith is general. The hadith is general. 50 women to one man. Oh, now I think I understand. Does that mean that during the latter days a man would marry 50 women? 50 Muslim women? No, because a Muslim man is only allowed to marry four Muslim women. Only allowed to marry four Muslim women. But what that means during the latter day is the ratio of men to women is for every one you have 50. It's for every one you have 50. And some of the scholars, some of the scholars say that in fact it would be more. And the Prophet ﷺ did not mean that specific number, but he meant to show you that there's going to be a great number of women for every man. There's going to be a great number of women for every man. Until you have like the example of 50 to 1. No. So the hadith is general. The hadith is general. It doesn't say Muslim, no, no, Muslim. You asked the question already, right? Let me get one more for somebody else, then I come back. Hold on. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, من يعيش منكم بعدي فسوف يرى اختلافا كثيرا فعليكم بالسنة وسنة خلفاء الراشدين المحدين عدوا عليها وتمشطوا بها بالنواجد وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور The Hadith said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a long Hadith that whoever lives after me, you're going to see much difference, confusion, discord. And he continued to tell us what the reason. He said, so upon you is to look, where is my sunnah? Where is my sunnah? Those that are referring back to my sunnah. Once you find that, hold on to it with your molar teeth. Once you find, on to it, when you, once you find that, grab it. Hold on to it with your molar teeth. And be aware of newly invented matters. And be aware of newly invented matters. The Prophet ﷺ is informing us something very great in this hadith. And that is, he's informing us that this fitna that you mentioned is going to take place. This fitna that you mentioned is going to take place. There's no choice that it takes place. There's no choice that this court fitna is going to take place. He was informed by the Messenger of Allah the one that does not, does not speak of his desires. But he told us the answer when that fits when we see that, that discord, that confusion, he told us the answer. And that is, look toward my sunnah. So the Muslim today, and he didn't say just look toward my sunnah, but he said hold on to it with your moral teeth, like, and he, with, your, with, your, with your life. So the Muslim today was the different groups. With the different groups and the different calls and the different propagation. That which is upon the Muslim is to sit down and reflect who really is calling to the sunnah of the Messiah of Sunnah. I think, it's, I think it's being taken into another. I have to be more specific. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, specifically, uh, a, a Muslim calls up Kufa yes. to take out money from another Muslim's account. Yes. Not in their rights. Right. Has that Muslim has that Muslim stolen it from the first one? What? Has that Muslim stolen from the first one? Nothing. If, if, for example, if I call uh, 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 if I call Kufa to take out Muslim from another to take out money from another Muslim's account, right? That Muslim that I'm taking out from his account has he done me wrong? See, I will have to. Yeah. See, I will, I will, see, I will have to sit down with you and get specifics. Because if the, if, the answer, if, the, if the question is general, the answer might be wrong. If the question is general, the answer might be wrong. You know, so I would, it seems like it's, it's some specifics. It seems like it's some specifics. You know, when you had from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one that I mentioned, when a person asks a question, he has to be very, very specific so that he can get the proper answer. Like he can get the proper answer. Because if he leaves it general, it's possible he gets an answer that supports him, but it's not the right answer. But it's not the right answer. So if you would like afterwards that we sit and specifically, I will answer here some of the What is the criteria for a person to give a khutbah? In general, the ulama mentioned that the person should be upon the sunnah. The person should be a person that's upon the sunnah known for uh, implementing and adhering to the sunnah of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, they should be a person that has something from the Book of Allah. Something from the Book of Allah. They don't have to be a big scholar with regards to the Book of Allah. Because we understand that then in certain parts of the world, we don't have scholars here in America. So does that mean that we can't have Jummah because we don't have a scholar here? No. But a person in the community that's known for the Sunnah and is known for obedience to Allah, is known for obedience to Allah, he's not a person known for sin, whether that, uh, you know, he's not a person that's known for having girlfriends, he's not a person that's known for drinking, he's not a person for list, known for listening to, the mu- listening to music and stuff like that. Right? So he's a person that follows the Sunnah. He's a person that's not known for sin. And with that, he has something from the Book of Allah and something from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. He's memorized a few surahs. He's memorized a few hadiths. You know, this is the criteria for a person giving a khutbah. And in giving the khutbah, he should mention to the people that that which is his benefit. He should mention to the people that was his benefit. He should not mention politics. He should not mention politics. He should not mention private affairs. He should not call people any people that have sins in the community. He should not call them out on the member. The public should have said, "Well, not do that." The public should have said, "Would say, uh, what is the situation with people doing this and that?" He would keep it general. So, for example, if you know a brother, uh, if you know a brother in the community uh, has a girlfriend, you shouldn't say, you know, and stay away from Abdullah. He has a girl and the likes of that. So politics should not be brought up. The sins of the community, the sins of, indiv- of specifics in the community should not be brought up. But in general, that which is a benefit. In general, that which is a benefit. A person that has the sunnah, knows the sunnah, fears Allah, and the person that has something from the Book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And of course, if there's, a, if there's a student that has gone abroad, if there's a student that's upon the sunnah that has gone abroad, then he should be the one that should give the khutbah. He should be the one that should give the khutbah. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. 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 I think you're referring to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى أسند الأمر إلى غير أهله The hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari in the book of knowledge. The hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari in the book of knowledge where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the last day would not come until the affair is given to other than its people. Al-Hafiz ibn Hajr al-Askalani he, in his explanation, he said this is talking about that the people, the affairs of the people, yani the people that have uh, authority in the affairs of the people who are the scholars, the people will no longer look towards them. After that takes place, then the, 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 the last day will come. Because the affairs in the community, مثلا, if the community has an issue, 
If the community has an issue, an affair, something of importance in the community, instead of the community calling over to the scholars, for example, in Saudi Arabia, or in Yemen, or in Jordan, or whatever, instead of the people calling to the scholars, they make their own decision. They make their own decision. And this has great importance in the community. So from that hadith, which is authentic, because it's not Bukhari, uh, the Father of Shorter mentioned that the, the last day would come once the people give the situation to other than its people, other than its rightful people. And that is, Yani, al Hazrat ibn Hajir mentioned that the people would turn away from the scholars. They would turn away from the scholars, they would make decisions themselves, they would have their own opinions, and they would leave alone the scholars. Yeah. And you should know that um, some of the, the ulama of today, they said that the people are bringing. Uh, the people are acting like the scholars are dead while the scholars are still living. The people are acting like the scholars are dead while the scholars are still living. And that's by not referring to the scholars. And the death of the scholars can be two ways. That they actually die, or the people no longer refer to them. So notice that the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah would not take away the knowledge by the chest of the men. But Allah would take away the knowledge by the scholars and by the death of the scholars. And the death of the scholars is two ways. Actually dying, and the people no longer taking from them. Once that happens, then the ignorance will remain and prevail. Father. No. Today, today, with the many forms of technology, no one, no one has an excuse for not having a connection. Because you have the telephone, you have the internet, you have uh, the likes, the telephone, the internet, the likes. Right? So, a person having difficulty is one thing. And with that, he buys books, he listens to tapes. Right? He buys books, but he listens, and he listens to tapes. But with that, he shouldn't say, okay, so I suffice with the books and the tapes. But he should try his very best. Try his very best to get the phone numbers from the internet, you know, to, for the scholars. If he does not speak the language, he can contact people that have studied with the scholars. And alhamdulillah, in America you have people that have studied with the scholars. You have people that have studied abroad with the scholars, some of them seven years, eight years, ten years, that have studied abroad with the scholars, studied in the Islamic universities, universities of the Panas Contact those people and don't get the answer from them. Contact those people and say to them, can you contact some of the scholars and ask them such and such? You know, which is something else very important. You have people that contact the, the students of knowledge here in America, and they get the answers from them. No, they should ask those students to contact the scholars. You know, if a brother calls me up, don't say, Mustafa, what do you think about such and such? Say, Mustafa, could you call six so-and-so and ask him what does he think about such and such? Because when, once, once, once he's contacted me and asked me, it's possible that individuals cause a fitness for me. It's possible that individuals cause a fitness for me by me starting to answer questions for myself. Oh, the scholars are still present, so I'm for, I've fallen into something wrong. Because I've given them an answer for myself. So one of the, the, the ways that the people here in America contact the scholars is by the, through the students of the scholars. Contact the students. And it's important. Don't tell, ask the student himself. Tell the student your question and say to him, ask some of the scholars and get back to me. The last question. Well, actually, you never asked the question, see? <laughs> we, we give out our phone numbers. We give out our phone numbers. I believe on, you have, uh, you have uh, Salafi Talk. You have some phone numbers on Salafi Talk. You have RighteousPath.com. You have phone numbers there. You have Troy. You have phone numbers there. You have Salafi Cast, all of them Salafi, Salafi websites. You know, all the Salafi websites you have, you know, the, the, the numbers and stuff. Hmm. No, I'm understood. I mean, be persistent in it. Be persistent. And there's several, so if you call up one student, and you give him your question, and he doesn't get the answer from the scholar, call up another. You know, call up another. And ask that one student for numbers of other students. Ask that one student for numbers of other students. Also, ask that student 
request from that student that when he gets the answer, he records it on a tape. So you can be accurate about what he heard. The last question. Uh, the brother's action when when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the Sunnah. Uh, the 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 nafq fisur, the blowing into the trumpet. Will there be any Muslims that would be uh, alive to hear that? You have a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is authentic, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned and before Yom al Allah would send a wind. Before Yom al Allah would send a wind. Any believers that are on the face of the earth, their lives will be taken with that wind. And then the worst of the people will remain on the earth. And then the worst of the people will remain on the earth. So that hadith is a proof. That hadith is a proof that the nafq is for Muslims, yani people that follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will not be present on the earth. They will not be present on earth because they will be, their lives would have been taken with the wind. The wind that will come before Yom al -Qiyama. The wind that will come before Yom al -Qiyama. And the only ones that would be present on the face of the earth are the worst of mankind. Taken from that hadith. No. The, that brother had a question. The angels. And then the scholars. That's something that's that's something that's a, that's a, that's a separate that's a separate shahada from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He is the only one that deserves to be worshipped, and the angels and the and the, the scholars. And the seventh one, not the one, not the one, that one, that one that took place when Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala created, or when Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala took the souls, or when Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala took the dhurriya of Adam from his backbone. And that was after Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala created Adam, and so that, that can be a proof against us. So that that can be a proof against us. So that's us being, that's us being witness against ourselves. It's us being witness of the tawheed of Allah against ourselves. So in Yom al Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, so in Yom al if any of us deny that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say, you bore witness yourself. You bore witness yourself when I took you out of the, the rib or out of the spine of Adam and Islam. So that's not that one. That's the different one. Last question. No, the worst of mankind. Yeah, the worst of mankind. So the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was taken with that wind. So who are the people who when they see the sun coming up from the west and out of Christ? That is right before, the ulama mentioned this, that, the ulama mentioned right before that. For these things take place at one particular time. At one particular time. Some of them are very close to one another. Some of them are very close to one another. Right? So it's possible, Wallahu alam, it's possible that one is right before the wind. Possible that one is right before the wind. Because that which is after the wind, from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everyone that believed, everyone that believed in that time, everyone that believed in that time, their lives will be taken with the wind. So there's no more believers. So there's no more believers after that time. Allah 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 Two things. Please name the six, the statement of Imam Shafi. Uh, Naam. Now, the ka'un, wa hirsun. The ka'un is intellect. Wa hirsun, uh, desire. Wa shihadun, the person has the, they have the strength to go out and seek it. Wa bulgatun, the means. Wa suhbatul ustad, the fifth, or the sixth is suhbatul ustad, the teacher. Wa tun is a man, and a long time. The sixth is a long time, a long period of time. No. That was the last one. <laughs> Um, we want to hold this final question until later on, inshallah, tonight. We'll have another question and answer session. Um, we're going to leave, inshallah, schedule the next 
talk will be between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock tonight. And we will be following second masses and we'll be serving food at uh, the Masjid al and 2904 Park. So I'll uh, encourage everybody to come out. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, humu wa bihamdik, wa sallam wa ilaha ala anta, wa sallam wa ta'ala.